Guys, welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today's going to be a great episode with Frank Sanders of Alaska Trophy Outfitters. We're going to be talking about the Alaska draw that's due here uh, December 15th. We're going to be talking about doll sheep, uh, brown bear, uh, mountain goat, black bears. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, different hunts uh, that Frank does. And he's got many, many years of uh, experience uh, doing these hunts, including some fantastic moose hunts. Uh, and uh, he's going to shed some light on hunting in Alaska. Uh, before we get to that, I want to thank you guys for all your uh, loyal support of this podcast. Uh, I want to thank each one of the sponsors and remind you that you can get great discounts uh, by using the J. Scott promo code. Uh, there's going to be commercials throughout the podcast uh, where you can take advantage of the J. Scott promo code. Uh, but uh, if you sign up for GoHunt.com Insider, you get a $50 Kuyu gift card sent to you immediately. Uh, if you sign up for the Outdoorsman's or excuse me, if you uh, purchase anything through the Outdoorsman's, use the J. Scott promo code. You get 10% off uh, everything there at the Outdoorsman's. Uh, if you use the promo code JSCOT16 with phone scope, you get 10% off on all phone scope apparel and products. Uh, and also real game calls, you actually get a 20% discount if you use the JSCOT promo code. So uh, thanks for supporting those sponsors. I hear from them every month uh, how uh, supportive you guys have been, and, and it's uh, overwhelming. Uh, thanks for that. Thanks for supporting. It makes this podcast possible. Uh, and, uh, we're, we're, uh, here about mid December and we're right in the middle of coos deer hunts uh, in, in Arizona, uh, over the counter archery deer hunts in Arizona. Uh, sheep season is about halfway through, uh, most of the Colorado, uh, Utah, uh, Montana, uh, Idaho, uh, Wyoming elk and deer hunts are over with. Um, continue to tag J Scott Outdoors, J Scott Outdoors podcast, both on Instagram. Uh, feel free to send me any emails, uh, questions, uh, comments that you have, people you want to see on the podcast. You can do that at jscottoutdoors at gmail.com. You can follow along my adventures on Instagram at jscottoutdoors, my associate Dar Colburn. Uh, on Instagram, my Facebook page, J. Scott Outdoors, and also on my website, J. Scott Outdoors. So, uh, great episode coming your way. Uh, thanks for your support, guys. Let's get right to it. Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today, we've got Frank Sanders of Alaska Trophy Outfitters uh, on the line. Uh, Frank, how you doing? I haven't seen you in a while. No, pretty good. Just trying to stay out of trouble, keep him busy guiding. Yeah. Um, Frank, you've been a guide in Alaska for a long time. Why don't you give the listeners a little bit of a bio on yourself and uh, what's led you up to where you're at now? You know, I was always, as a kid, of course, intrigued with Alaska. And um, it was back in 1990. I got an invite to help out on Prince of Wales Island. And uh, so I did that. Um, I was in college at the time. I went up there for a month. And then I did the same thing in 91. And um, I always wanted to go back, and I finished my college up, and I was actually working in the archery industry, and the company I was with was changing hands, and I had an opportunity to go to Alaska. That would have been late 96, and I'd always wanted to go. To be honest, I couldn't afford to hunt, you know, sheep or goats, grizzlies or browns without a guide, or with a guide, but as a resident, you could. And so uh, I think I had 1400 bucks in my pocket in my chocolate lab, and I had it up, and what, 21 years later, it's been pretty good to me. That's awesome. So are you a full-time resident in Alaska, or do you spend a majority of your time uh, here in the lower 48? You know, I, I used to be up there full-time. Um, I'm still a resident, spend all, I think last year I got there, beginning of April, we started on Kodiak, and I actually finished on Kodiak in, um, what was it, mid-November, and so... Uh, my wife actually lives in Northern California, so I uh, now I come down for the couple months that we're off and spend it here. That's great. That's great. Uh, um, Frank, your uh, bread and butter, so to speak, is brown bear and mountain goat, but you've pretty much hunted everything in Alaska. 
Um, tell me about some of your experiences as far as guiding some of the different animals. Um, I know you've also had a fishing operation um, of which I think uh, you're not doing anymore, but um, just talk a little bit in, in general terms about some of the experience you have up there. Well, I started out um, in central Alaska, you know, after the Prince of Wales stuff, and we were doing, you know, primarily moose, caribou out there and some grizzly, and then we would go move to the Alaska Peninsula later, and uh, we'd hunt brown bears. And so I did that for a few years, and I finally went out on my own. And when I did, we'd had quite a few wolf problems, and we watched, it was actually amazing to watch in such a short time, the number of moose dwindle that it did. And yet, on the other hand, I was watching these brown bears, you know, numbers increase. And so I really started to focus on the brown bears. Uh, we have moose there, obviously. You know, we've done, we do sheep, we do goats, quite a few goats. And um, so when I first started, of course, I wanted to do everything. You know, I wanted to be, you know, no pun intended, one-stop shopping. But really, when you get into it, as you well know, when you find a niche and you're, you know, you tend to be good at it or your area is good, you know, I mean, the culmination of everything, I started to stick with, you know, primarily brown bear, primarily moose, primarily mountain goat, and then we've got also some tremendous black bear hunting. But, um, you know, our doll sheep area, one's gone to a draw, and um, things have changed, obviously, over the last 20 years. So, you know, we've stuck with, like I said, those things that we know, and, you know, we've... We do exceptionally well on brown bear. You know, I've got a great area. I've got great guides that have been with me for years. Um, you know, it's in the same camps every year. You know, it's not like we're moving around much. And um, My you know, like, my first question would be uh, for you, Frank, uh, for those listening, what is the difference between a brown bear and a grizzly, and what delineates that, that difference? The diff- essentially, they're the same bear. Um, what delineates it is... If you look, there's a line that Boone and Crockett has drawn, and Boone and Crockett and SCI vary a little, but essentially in layman's terms, a grizzly bear is an interior bear, a bear that's you know going into hibernation earlier, a lot of times late September, October, coming out late April, or even May. As to where a brown bear, like you look at our brown bears on Kodiak, the season doesn't even end until November 30th, and then it opens again April 1st. Um, and the biggest difference is the size. You know, a seven-foot grizzly bear, you know, that's a nice grizzly bear, you know, kind of the mark we shoot for. As to where a brown bear, you know, nine feet would be, you know, what we would call, a, you know, what we're looking at. So it's basically a line, but you're telling me the, they're basically the same bear, but from where they live and what they eat, the brown bears actually get bigger than grizzly bear? Is that what you're saying? Quite a bit bigger. And a lot of people, you know, that don't know, they always feel that the grizzly is the biggest of the bears where, you know, it's actually the brown bear. Gotcha. And uh, these brown bear hunts that you do, Frank, uh, do you have to draw them or can people just contact you and and come hunt brown bear um, just over the counter, so to speak? The majority of our hunts are over the counter. Um, They're done on the Alaska Peninsula. And the way that works is it's very limited the way the quality stays what it is on the peninsula is it's only open in the spring of even years and the fall of odd years. So, you know, for instance, we hunted this year, the spring of 16. Now we did not hunt the fall of 16. Um, and we will not hunt the spring of 17. So we'll hunt again in September. And when it does open, I've got two areas, one open September 20th till October 20th and the other is October 1st to the 20th. And so essentially you've got a 30 or a 20 day season every 18 months. And then our spring season is September 10th to the 30th and, um, you know, a 20 day season then. So and you said September, but, uh, is that correct? You were saying spring. I think you meant, um, Oh, excuse me. yeah, excuse me. May, May, May 10th to the 30th is the spring season. And then the fall season is, um, in one of our areas, September 20th, October 20th, the other is uh, October 1st, October 20th for the fall seasons. Gotcha. And it sounds like you have multiple areas to hunt brown bear. We do. And then on the other uh, side of it, I have, um, we have Kodiak also. Now, and Kodiak is on a draw. And 
we're looking at a deadline coming up here December 15th to apply for Kodiak. And um, it's another one that's very something you'll see with us that you, I don't think I've seen, you know, in a lot of the states I apply for, is as an outfitter, I can only apply as many clients as there are tags. And so our spring area, or our area for spring is three tags. So I'm allowed three applicants, and then my partner, he puts in three applicants also. And then we, he works with me, and, um, you know, we put in here by December 15th. And the nice thing about it is they let us know typically right around mid-February if you drew. Um, and so it's not a long wait. I mean, you find out a couple months in advance. But for guys that don't want to do that, you know, we've always got the peninsula. And uh, for those listening, when you talk about the peninsula, geographically, explain to me when I'm looking at an Alaskan map what you're calling the peninsula. What it is, it's, it's the Alaska Peninsula, and it's a strip of land. It's essentially over 600 miles long, and it starts from, essentially from about the bottom of what, the, what we call the Alaska Range, and it goes all the way down. And you look at a map of Alaska, you'll see the southwest makes a big, long dip, and it'll go out into a small chain of islands. Um, a lot of people are familiar with you know, some of the crabbing shows. When you look all the way down at the end of that peninsula, you see Dutch Harbor on Alaska, and so when guys say, you know, we're, we want to hunt the peninsula, there is, I mean, like I said, literally 600 miles of it. And, you know, so when they hear about all the outfitters on the Alaska Peninsula, they think, well, there must be a lot of guys there. I mean, it's such a vast expanse. And, uh, I mean, you just can't even, it's, it's hard to fathom, really. So, I mean, in other words, the Alaskan Peninsula is surrounded by the Bering Sea. Is that correct? The Bering's on the north. And then you've got the Pacific on the south. Okay, okay. And so it's the southwest, um, what is that, like Unit 10, Unit 9? Uh, unit 9. Unit 9. Unit 9, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, and um, so if I heard you right, the you can only apply the number of applicants for the number of tags. So in other words, if you had 100 people that wanted to brown bear hunt with you, you could only apply three of them? True. So it's how do you determine who gets to apply with you or not, or what? how do you work that? What I've done is, um, I mean, obviously I have a priority list. Um, you know, if you've been with me applying for a few years, you get first rights. Um, and I've had guys that drew the first year, and I've had guys that have been in for multiple years and not got it. Um, what some of my guys have done is the difference in Kodiak and the Alaska Peninsula as far as bear size, body size, is six of one, half dozen of another. The only thing that I see different is our skull size tends to be better on Kodiak. I've taken more yeah, Boone and Crockett bears there. Um, but the thing that I, the point I was going to get at is some of my guys that have applied, obviously I keep them in the loop. I send an end of season email. Um, you know, we just finished up. We did a hunt here on Kodiak last month, so I'm getting ready to send that out. When they see the caliber of bears that we kill on the peninsula, a lot of them have just said, hey, you know what, let's go get a bear. Right. Yeah. So in other words, you get them fired up about bear hunting, they don't care whether they get it on the peninsula or Kodiak, and a lot of them just want to get the guaranteed tag. Exactly. You know, they can plan. Some guys, you know, they don't mind. Other guys want to be able to plan something. You know, like I have two, spring of 2018, you know, um, guys that are scheduled in for there and fall of 19 because they want to be able to plan that. Um, you know, a couple of reasons for that. One, a guy obviously wants to be able to plan. Two, it's not a cheap hunt. And so what some guys have done over the years, they're like, hey, you know, can we do a payment system? Can we pay you? I said, you know, absolutely. And so at that point, I just take that and put it in a savings account. And, um, you know, obviously until that year when the hunt comes, we don't touch it. And it allows guys to work with it, and it also allows them to lock in the price at the time. You know, if it. In other words, in other words, as the years go on, the price of that animal goes up because of everything always goes exactly. up. It allows them to lock in a price two years prior, and it also allows them to chip away on a payment plan if if that's what they choose. Exactly. Yep. And you know, the biggest thing, you know, when you see fuel prices varying, um, that's our biggest thing because everything we do is remote. You know, even though a lot of the stuff I have is on state land, I have yet to this day 
to have somebody else walk into one of our camps. We're landing in Super Cubs. Um, a lot of our camps require a couple flights. They'll take a bush flight, be it in a beaver or an otter. And then from that point on, we'll Super Cub into camp. And for those who aren't familiar with the Super Cub, it's essentially a two-person a two plane, one person being the pilot and the second person being the passenger. And um, when people see that we're limited to, you know, 65 to 70 pounds of gear, that is the primary reason. Our strips are incredibly small and tight. Um, you know, they're in places where we've walked a couple of days to get in there and put in an airstrip. And, you know, you could make them a little bigger, but we like to keep them small because we don't, you know, we don't want yeah. any company. Yeah. It, tell me how a typical um, hunt either on the peninsula or on Kodiak goes as far as um, from the time the person, you know, gets to Alaska, um, you know, the actual transport, yep. you mentioned a couple different flights, um, kind of walk me through that. What most of my guys do, um, and this is all, you know, for the Alaska Peninsula or for, um, for the goat or moose or even black bear, is uh, hunters, I'll have them come in, let's just say, you know, your opening day is the 10th. What we'll have them do is get on the, typically the afternoon of the 8th. Uh, myself or one of my guides will pick them up at the airport. The first thing we do is, uh, is we go to the rifle range. And if they're bow hunters, you know, we take them to my house. I've got, you know, multiple 3D targets. They go through all their gear. You know, we'll go through everything, go over a checklist. You know, I, I sent everybody out a checklist prior. Um, there are certain times when people say, hey, I don't want to fly with a sleeping bag. You know, I don't have a place to get hip boots. Whatever it may be, we get everything covered on that day or the 8th or the morning of the 9th. And then we're scheduled to fly out, you know, the day of the 9th. And, um... You know, some people like to stay in hotels. A lot of hunters, I tell them, hey, you know, if you're good, you can just, you know, stay at my house. And um, at that point, we leave all their hard cases. We leave any big wheel duffel bags, whatever they have, break everything down. I give them a soft case for their gun or a soft case for their bow. And, um, you know, make sure all licenses, everything's, you know, up to, t up to par. And, um, and then at that point is when we fly out. A lot of times what we'll do is myself or one of the guides will go in a super cub. They'll fly directly to one of the camps. And by the time that cub comes back, we'll be at the pickup point. And at that point there, we'll shuttle, you know, the next the hunter out to that guide, you know, the next guide into the camp, and then follow suit with another hunter, you know, depending on where we're at or what we're doing. Um, with our goat hunts, we're flying out. We're going in a turbine otter, and we're landing incredibly high. The reason we take a, a turbine otter is because the lake's what we call one way. We can only take off going one way. And the biggest thing with flying anywhere, especially Alaska, you need, you usually take off into the wind. Whatever that wind is equates to ground speed. And so when we call this a one way lake, you need a lot of horsepower to get in and get out. And um, it's an incredibly expensive flight. But the difference is where we're hunting mountain goats. And I don't want to shoot myself in the foot here, but where we're hunting mountain goats, most of my guys have been done the first day. And I had a hunter two years ago that was 76. He hunted moose with me, and he thought he'd... And I told him, I said, Dan, if you don't get a goat, I said, I won't charge you. I said, it's it's not that hard. And he shot a beautiful nine-and-a-half-inch goat the first day. Um, so even though it's more expensive to get in there, once you get there, you're in a nice camp. You're not backpacking up there. We're typically within 1,000 yards of goats. And, uh, yeah. Wow. And and are those goat tags a uh, draw, or are they also over the counter? And in, in other words, can people just call you up and book? A no, goat they're all a draw. Um, and you know, Alaska. For those who don't know, Alaska has never had a point system or any kind of a preference system. Every year, you know, you go in random. And so I actually met with a couple of the Board of Game guys, and we've gone over it multiple times because, as you're aware, I, I apply for about every state in the frickin' union. Um, you know, I'm not that smart. I just keep doing it. So they've asked my opinions either on a bonus point or a preference point, and we had a meeting about it years ago, and nothing came of it. And then this last year we did again, and they came up with their own system. Um, the way the draw worked before was let's just say you know jay scott and dark holborn want to put it for goat you're allowed three choices 
And so those three choices are three different areas. And what you do is you put, you know, your first choice is the area you really want to hunt, you know, obviously, so on and so on. The difference with Alaska is all three of those choices go in to a draw. You could essentially draw all three tags. What the state would do then is look at which one you chose first, and then the other two tags would go back in the draw, and they would move on to the next person. What they've done now is they've upped that three choices to six choices. And you can put all six choices in the same unit. So, yeah. yeah so, so you can put all your eggs in one basket, or you can take from, from the hunt you want the most to the hunt you want yep. the least and do one yep. through six. And so what, what yeah. I think is going to help there, it wasn't the, you know, what I felt ideal, but I think what it's really going to help is that the area where we're at, it's one of the farthest away on the Kenai Peninsula. And I think, actually, I don't think I know what a lot of people do as where Alaska, you only have to have a hunting license and it's just $5 per choice to apply. So they look at, you know, their first go choices where they really want to go, always want to hunt there. Second choice is like, you know, I had a friend that hunt there, so it's supposed to be okay. Third choice, I think, a lot of times is, what the heck, it's five bucks. If we get it, maybe we'll plant it. If not, you know, so be it. And so out of the 30 tags they issue, only half of the tags are being used. And so what I'm really hoping is that by doing this, for the guys who really want to go to my area, by putting all those eggs in one basket – you know, I think it'll increase the odds. Because right now we're at about 20% draw odds. And um, I think, you know, I think that's going to get better. And in Alaska, do you have to apply by yourself or can you put in with someone else? And what's the maximum number? You, you can, can do a party in? application for most all hunts, um, but the max on the party is two people. Yeah. Two people. Yeah. Okay. And I, the way I understand it, you do you have you have to have a contract with an outfitter before you apply, and and you, and and I guess the second question of that is you can't just apply without already having a prior agreement with the outfitter. Yeah, correct? what it was was um, years ago, and it started with Kodiak. Um, guys were putting in for for a tag. Let's just say you know they heard the Alulik Peninsula was excellent, so they would put in for a tag, and then they'd get it. Then they'd contact the outfitter and find out that this hunt, you know, is 20000 or you know, in excess of 20000 and be like, well, heck, that's too much for me. Well, then the outfitter at that point where there's only, you know, two or three, four tags is stuck. And so what they did was they went to this guide client agreement, and so you had to have that. Well, then, so that was before you applied. You had to fill that out, and the guide filled out his part, and then we would send that into Kodiak Fishing Game. Then they did the same thing with Unit 14C, which most people know the Chugach range for sheep. They did it for um, most of 14C, guide client agreement. Now, this year, they have taken, like my go areas in the past, I've never needed it. This year, the 2016 application period, we need it for everything. We need it for our sheep area. We need it for every goat area. Um, and obviously, Kodiak's always needed it. Uh, and so now... It is with every hunt. Gotcha. And um, so f you have to buy, uh, in order to apply, you have to pay, I think it's an $85 license. And then um, each animal after that is $5. So in other words, you, you your 85 bucks yep. is gone. That's your Alaskan license. And then it's $5 yep. per animal. Um, and... Speaking in generalities, uh, brown bear hunts um, are going to cost. Uh, give me the breakdown of, of, of range in Alaska, and, and you can tell me yep. your price or, or not, but just give me the range of what, like, a brown bear hunt costs, a mountain goat, a moose. Just kind of go through some of that, and doll sheep, just so people get an yep. idea of uh, kind of price range. So, my hunts, depending on the unit, we do, we also do some hunts in a unit called 16, which is a very it's an area that's open year-round, um, and you're allowed two bears a year. As to where Kodiak and the peninsula, you're allowed one bear every four years. And as I mentioned earlier, you know they're open for 25 days in the or 20 days in the spring, and you know 20 to 30 in the fall. Unit 16 is open year-round. 
a top end bear in that unit is typically around seven and a half to eight feet. And those hunts like that, you know, are typically anywhere from 10 to 12,000. And so that being the lower end, not that that's any less of a trophy, but most guys want to shoot a nine foot plus bear. When you move up into that category, and I, you know, I keep referring to the peninsula, you work up to the peninsula or Kodiak, you know, some of the better areas. I'd say your hunts are going to start around 18,000 and go all the way up, you know, 26,000 is what, um, you know, I see quite a few guys in the 24 to 26,000 range now. And that's just a supply and demand issue of the fact that there's not very many uh, tags and not many bears out there. So it's just, it's just um, what the market will bear. It is. And it's, no yeah. And it's demand. also, yeah, exactly. It is, but it's also, you know, for the guys that, that do well, um, you know, and have good quality bears and have that reputation, you know, those are the guys you see booked up, you know, a couple years in advance, you know, a lot of it, as you know, I mean, it's a, it's a big world, but it's a really small world when it comes down to it. Um, you know, somebody gets burnt, you know, boy, they tell everybody, you know, an outfitter does that to a few people and you'll watch them go downhill quick as to where, you know, guys do the opposite. They take care of their hunters, you know, of course you can't guarantee game. I don't care where you are, but when you can guarantee a good guide, you can guarantee nice camps, you know, we're going to feed guys, take care of them and a good area, you know, that has the genetics, has everything they need, you know, and then hunting and luck come into play. But that luck that you've just made is, you know, I don't know how to phrase that. People say, you know, I, I'm fortunate I do a lot of hunting. And they say, well, you're lucky. And I said, well, I kind of do my homework beforehand. I don't just go out, you know, it's like somebody wanting to shoot a 190-inch whitetail. I don't think Pennsylvania is the best place to start. You know, I'd go to Kansas or Iowa. Right. Um, well, so in other words, you set yourself, you set your clients up for them to be exactly, successful. Exactly, exactly. And um, so anyway, so the point being, as we just went over, you know, the price is like that. It is supply and demand. And when it gets down to it, even though we're talking about a huge area with all those outfitters, you're right. I mean, there's not, you know, I'll do six to seven hunters a fall and usually, you know, four to five in a spring. And so the supply and demand is it. And, um, you know, obviously having the quality that the Alaska Peninsula offers, you know, is doesn't sell itself by any means, but it sure does help. For sure. Let's take a quick break here. GoHunt.com Insider is by far the most valuable tool a Western hunter could give themselves. GoHunt.com Insider are the industry leaders and number one source for Western hunting for a lot of reasons. GoHunt.com Insider have changed the game for how hunts and hunting information are found. Within a matter of minutes using filtering 2.0, you'll be able to filter by state, species, residency, odds of drawing a tag, specific hunting dates, and harvest success percentages to find the hunts that fit exactly what you're looking for. If you are a guy that applies across the West or just in your home state but want to find some new opportunity, there's no better way to do it than using GoHunt.com Insider. As an exclusive offer to my listeners, if you sign up for a GoHunt.com Insider membership for $149 a year and use the promo code JSCOTT, at checkout, you'll receive a $50 Kuyu gift card. Head on over to GoHunt.com forward slash insider and get yourself the most valuable membership a hunter could have. I have known the owners of the Outdoorsman's in Phoenix for over 20 years. They are the authority on optics and hunting gear. Outdoorsman's is the leading designer and manufacturer of high quality tripods, mounting accessories, and pack systems for all hunters. Their customer service is the best in the business. Go to Outdoorsmans.com or call 1-800-291-8065 and use the J. Scott promo code to receive 10% off any products. Okay, Frank, what I hear you saying, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, what I hear you saying is you end up building relationships and you have reputations and other outfitters have reputations. And if there's guys out there that are doing things on the fringe or, or you know, uh, not treating people right, the word spreads around very, very quickly. And so y you personalize all of what you're doing. In other words, 
Uh, it sounds like you, you, you run a, a, a somewhat smaller operation where you're focusing on super high quality hunts um, and not just everybody's not a number. You like people are staying at your house and, you know, you, you become, I mean, do you almost become life friends with most of the guys that come? Well, a lot of them, we absolutely do. And I mean, obviously, you know, I just got back from Nebraska with some of my clients and, um, you know, anybody that's been in this, you know, a lot of these guys, you can't help but, you know, become friends with them. Um, and like you said, being smaller like I am has kind of allowed me, you know, I don't want to say to pick and choose because that's not the right phrase, but there are certain times I get calls and I just, you know, I'm not rude, but I just let guys know I, I don't think I'm I'm the guy for you. Um, a lot of times, not a lot, once in a while we get a call and somebody's expectations um, you know, are, are so far beyond that I don't want to set myself up for failure from the start. And one thing I've, you know, for guys I meet at sports shows or, or wherever I may meet them, when I tell them I'm not, you know, I'm not a booking agent, I'm going to be there when you land. More than likely there's a 9 out of 10% or 9 out of 10 chance that I'm going to be the guy that picks you up. You know, i got to look you in the face when I tell you we're probably going to see, you know, two or three shooter bears in a 10-day hunt, we'll probably see 12 or 14 bears, you know, or, hey, you know, this goat area is freaking excellent. You know, I'm stepping off of that plane with you. You know, it's not just a handshake and catch you later. Um, and then, and on that note, I've got a couple of booking agents who are tremendous about stuff like that. Um, you know, so I don't want people to think, well, you know, all booking agents are bad. What I was trying to get at is that I've had a lot of guys who have had bad experiences you know, had an agent or somebody promise this or that, and, you know, they land in camp, and half the time the outfitter or guide, you know, right? Yeah, or this yeah. is the first time he hears about what these people are promised. And, um, and yeah, you know, there's, it's been a learning experience over the years. I will tell you that, but, but you were spot on. It is a smaller outfit. Um, you know, don't take a ton of guys. You know, we only do a couple moose hunts every other year. Um, our moose hunts, they vary. Uh, I say are moose something Alaska. I would say you're looking at starting around fourteen thousand up to about twenty thousand, know, depending on where you're at. Um, logistics of getting in, you know, there's still a few guys who use horses. Most everything is fly in, and so when you look at like I was talking earlier, the Super Cub. When you talk about flying a moose out, you know you've got three trips right there with the Super Cub, and the thing about that too. Yeah. Even if a guy's light on the last trip out, he cannot take a person on that flight. And so a lot of times people say, well, how can it be so expensive? Well, once again, logistics of getting there and then not so much that, but of getting out is a, is a large, large factor. Is yeah. the problem. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and the moose you have, I mean, you have some unbelievable quality moose, uh, uh, correct. I mean, uh, but the pr the challenge for you is you only have a yep. couple hunts, um, but the quality is unreal, isn't some, it? We've killed some tremendous bulls. Um, one of the things we have bordering one of our primary units is National Park and Preserve. And so, like one area I have, it's only a couple mile drainage. The difference being we have the cows there. And so our moose hunt, our season is only 10 days long. That's it. And I tell my guys, anybody that hunts, especially this one camp, I said, you know, it opens on the 5th. And I said, there's a pretty good chance the 5th, 5th of September. Of so I tell them, okay. hey, 5th, 6th, 7th of September, I said, you might not see a single thing. And I said, but I will tell you, I have yet to have a hunter hunt past the 10th. And they're like, what do you mean? All of a sudden, those bulls they do. show they do. up. They do. And when they show up, I mean, it's not like they show up in hordes. Um, you know, but I tell guys, you're probably going to see two or three bulls. And I said, out of those two or three, though, you know, if there's three of them, two of them are going to be good ones. And when I say good, I'm typically talking, you know, 60 inches plus. And, and then my other camp, you know, it's a long valley, um, and it can be the same way. You know, sometimes I've got multiple bulls staged up, you know, on the top end where camp is. Other days, you know, we go three or four or five days, see nothing, and then, boom, you know, we've got, you know, two bulls working their way up the valley. And... Um, but yeah, we've we've taken some some great bulls. That's for darn sure. That's awesome. I want to talk to you a little bit about doll sheep um, and ask you if you would kind of break down the doll sheep units, um, talking in general terms. 
Um, I, I know each one of them kind of has uh, their differences as far as quality of animals, you know, yeah. terrain, um, you know, numbers of animals, that kind of thing. Can you kind of break those down? And I understand that uh, sheep isn't uh, any more isn't your specialty, so to speak. Correct? Yeah, well, you know, we used to do a couple hunts a year um, in one of the areas we had at the time was an open area, and I just I knew it very well. In we um, like I said, we would do two hunts max, and we were you know it worked out it worked out excellent. But what they did, the area was getting a lot of pressure, and I mean I'd be lying if I didn't say ram numbers weren't declining. So what they did was they turned it into a draw area. And so since that's happened with me concentrating more on the goats early and then, you know, the moose and then obviously the brown bear, um, I have not got away from the sheep. I still have a couple of sheep areas that I, that I keep, uh, but they're all a draw. So, you know, here we are back at that draw thing, you know, tough for a guy to plan. Um, but yeah, you know, and what you were saying about, you know, the state's got multiple, there's about a half a dozen different major ranges and you look at the Brooks Range, which is probably the mellowest of them all, to the Wrangell St. Elias, which is probably the gnarliest of them all. Um, and then as far as, you know, sheep quality, you know, 14C in the Chugach Mountains, which is literally right. I mean, you land in Anchorage, you're looking at it between there and Eagle River, um, you know, has produced some of the biggest rams ever. And if you look at, you know, like the governor tag and the auction tag, um, you know, that is that is where those guys are typically always hunting, you know, as far as from a score wise. Yet I've seen, you know, sheep in the in the low forties come out of the out of the Brooks range. Um, the Wrangles prior to the Chugach range, you know, picking up, um, has had some tremendous sheep. Now, there's a large park there and so you know, those rams live. Residents who live inside the area can hunt it. But other than that, you know, there's no pressure. Uh, a lot of the state, you know, something that, you know, especially for people from the lower 48 that is incredibly foreign, a lot of Alaska is open area. You know, me as a resident, myself as a resident, can get a tag and fly into an area and hunt sheep. You know, and you look down here and I've got, you know, 16 points here, 18 points there. You know, max points, Montana, you know, with the chance of never doing it, it's the opposite in Alaska. Um, that being said, a real good friend of mine runs an outfit up in the Brooks Range, and, you know, when you book a sheep hunt, you're booked, you're in, because you can just buy that tag over the counter. And he is still, you know, he's shooting consistently 36 to 39-inch rams. They do hit that magical 40-inch mark once in a while. Uh, but if a guy's really looking for a book sheep, you know, just like somebody looking for a book deer, you know, they're going to want to, you know, try, try for the Kaibab, the Ponsagon, wherever it may be. Um, they would want to, you know, they're going to start applying for obviously some of those tough to draw areas, some of the areas, you know, more coveted tags for sure. What would you say um, the most coveted doll sheep unit in Alaska? It's 14C, is? hands down. Yep. 14C. And then what would you say would be second? Um, well, if you look at 14C and you break it down, I think, and don't, don't quote me on this because it's not verbatim because there's quite a few and I don't keep up with the sheep stuff, but I think in 14C, I think there's like eight different units inside of it. Um, and so you've got all these drainages, you know, multiple different, different areas to hunt. But as far as from a trophy perspective, I would say the Wrangles would be second from, you know, just from an area standpoint. And when I say the Wrangell, something a lot of people have heard of is the Toke Management Area, spelled T-O-K. Um, it's a draw area, and it's in the Wrangells, and so it produces some great sheep. So from a drawing standpoint, I would say 14C gets the majority with a Toke coming in the, you know, as a second, you know, and Toke being, like I said, the Wrangell St. Elias in the mountains there. Um, and then the majority of the open area, I would say, you know, guys hunt the Alaska Range, and then the Brooks Range, which when we talk about these ranges, they're they're tremendous. I mean, the Brooks Range goes all the way from the Canadian border. It goes across the whole, you know, all the way across Alaska towards the coastal area of Kotzebue. So you're talking a thousand plus miles long. Tremendous area. And now, 
I thought I heard you say that the doll sheep, there are some areas that you can just buy a tag and go home. Absolutely. Is that correct? A, non, yep. a non-resident. So that it's not no, all. Not done. at all. I would um, say a better, better than 60% of Alaska's sheep areas are open general areas. If, if not more so. Okay. So, so non-residents can also they can apply for the, for these units, but they can also if they want to hunt Alaska, they can also call up the the outfitters that have those um, outfitting regions and just buy a tag. Absolutely. Just, boom, they're going sheep yep. hunting next year, if the, if they yep. have availability. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That um, that uh, that's good. What about um? Like uh, hunter education requirements, um, is there age requirements? Do you know those? Um, One of the, what you'll see is, uh, as far as hunter education, I want to say if you're born after 86, yeah, gosh, don't quote me on this. I'm thinking really hard here. I think if they're under 12 years old, they have to have hunter education. Um, I know that there's not, I don't think there is, because I see 9- and 10-year-old kids killing sheep. One thing you'll see, you know, when you get the Alaska regulations, um, you know, they've got a pretty good-sized supplement that they really emphasize the kids. And um, you see a lot of kids, you know, young kids, sheep, goat, and um, and a lot of caribou. But I don't think... I actually have it here in front of me. It says... Uh... Um, hunters are required to be at least 10 years of age by the starting date of the hunting season. Um, and if you were born after January 1st, 1986, you're required to have taken a hunter education class. So it is after 86. Okay. Okay. And then, um, what are the regulations with bow hunting? Uh, you know, can you use a bow on some of these rifle tags, or do you have to have archery specific? Tags? Um, no, th- that's one thing about the state. There's not. You'll see there's a few archery only areas, and what those are, are typically either um, residential areas, or and when I say residential, I mean you're not driving down you know Bain Street shooting. R- r- rural areas, <laughs> what I meant, but. Um, some of the more rural areas, and then some of the areas that are easier to access. Uh, a few of my mountain goats I've got off one unit, and what they would do is they'd have their draw hunt, and after the draw hunt, they would take in, you know, let's say they were going to take 10 goats. They took four. Well, if they open up to a rifle, they, what they'll do is they'll open up to a registration hunt, and they'll give you like a three-day window to hunt. Well, if they open up an area that's easy to access a rifle, you know, for three days and they want to, say, shoot four goats, you know, they'll have 12 dead. So what they'll do with those areas sometimes is open up to archery registration. And so with hunts like that, you do have to have IBEP. You do have to be certified. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, describe your mountain goat hunts um, for the listeners as far as kind of a – not necessarily getting yep. to the area, but like waking up and kind of how the day goes on a typical mountain goat hunt. We're out there, you know, we, we, we just got it. We have tent camp set up and um, we land obviously on a lake there. You know, typically just wake up. I mean, it's not, you don't have to get up the crack of dawn. Um, you know, we're usually out of there within an hour, hour and a half after light, you know, depending on what weather looks like. And we don't typically go that far from camp. Typically we're in about 30 minutes of camp. There's a couple different vantage points where we'll sit and watch these goats move, and there's some saddles where they go back and forth. And um, you know, obviously, depending if it's bow hunting or gun hunting, you know how we set up or or what we do. Um, but it's a lot of sitting, a lot of glassing, and not a lot of cover, uh, or not a lot of you know, covering ground, because where we're at, it's a pretty tight area. Um, we've got a giant ridge behind camp, and you know, my rifle guys have shot quite a few goats off of that ridge. They travel back and forth. And, um, you know, as far as my bow hunters, there's some pinnacles we'll get up in and typically just wait it out. You know, those goats, they've been, you know, they're so habituated in their ways. And being that we fly into an area like that, it's, you know, it's pretty costly to get into. We've never had anybody else bother us. 
And so what that equates to, obviously, is animals that aren't really molested. And so as long as you don't right. bump them too hard, you know, I've got guys that are very, you know, guys that are excited and really want to go. And, I mean, I used to be that guy. You know, I would, I'd blow more stuff out. I don't, you know, whether it was goats, sheep, mule deer, elk, I was just gung-ho to go. And I have no problem with that unless we're going to, you know, bump stuff. When you know animals are going to come through, especially quality, you know, when people say, why are we doing this? I'll look at them and say, because it works. You know. Right. So in other words, you're taking more of a passive strategy of just kind of observing. And then when you get one in the right spot, then you move in. Exactly. And done. Exactly. And, you know, like I said, when it all boils down to it, you know, guys kind of look at you and they're like, wow, you know, that, that really worked. And, you know, trust me, it didn't just happen overnight. You know, it's years and years of, of you know, not failure. I mean, we've always got our animals. But there's times where we've done a lot more work than we ever should have had to. So I can say that. Right. Let, let's take another quick break here. PhoneScope is a company that makes custom-molded, precisely engineered smartphone digiscoping adapters. Photographing wildlife has never been easier. It is simple to text photos and videos from your smartphone and share them with your friends. PhoneScope stands behind their product with a 100% money-back guarantee. Get yours now by using the JSCOT16 promo code and receive 10% discount on all purchases. Check them out at PhoneScope, that's P-H-O-N-E-S-K-O-P-E dot com, or on Instagram, at PhoneScope. Real Game Calls featuring the Elk Reel. Real Game Calls makes innovative, realistic, and easy-to-master calls using their proprietary, revolutionary design. They are located and manufactured in Gypsum, Colorado. Their calls were designed and battle-tested on some of the hardest-hunted terrain on Earth. Check out ElkReel.com. Use the promo code JSCOTT and receive a 20% discount on all purchases. Go to www.ElkReel.com. Okay, Frank, uh, for years you had a fishing operation there in Alaska. Um, describe some of the fishing opportunities, uh, you know, maybe what you had going on and what uh, what others can also enjoy there uh, as far as uh, fishing. What I did is I had, um, I had a, a 33-foot offshore boat that we ran halibut and uh, combo trips on. When I say combo, we would fish for silver salmon, lingcod, uh, yellow eye, multiple species of rockfish. Um, you know, halibut is, we live on the Kenai Peninsula, you know, they call it the Alaska's playground because it's probably, I'd say, 80% of the fishermen that come to Alaska, that's where they're at. Um, so what we did was we fished offshore for halibut. That's primarily what I did. And I had a couple boats on the Kenai River that would fish. You know, a lot of people know the Kenai, it's, you know, world famous for its salmon. The world record king came off there. I think it was somewhere around 97 pounds. Um so we did charters on the on the Kenai for king salmon, and then later in the season we would do silver salmon and sockeye salmon. And then, um, like I said, I fished halibut, you know, May, June, July, August. Those pretty much, that's about the four months that the fishing's good. I would say if a guy was breaking it down into just fishing, you know, June, July, and August, you know, is pretty much where it's at. And, um, you know, a lot of variation there as far as, on the peninsula, one end we have Seward, which is this glaciated mountainous area where, you know, I might be 100 yards offshore and be 700 feet of water. Yet on the west side, we have Cook Inlet, where I spend most of my time fishing halibut. We could be 15 miles offshore, you know, and be in 200 feet of water with a sandy bottom. And typically all we would catch then is halibut. We catch a few gray cod, hardly any variation in species as to where Seward, you, know, you might be fishing for 20 different species of fish. And um, it's about 90 miles from where we live in Soldotna. And then what a lot of people are familiar with is Homer, which is 70 miles south of us. And that is the halibut capital of the world. And um, so it doesn't take a neurosurgeon to figure out that a lot of halibut boats there. Um, a lot of guys do salmon. You know, some do sightseeing. You know, there's, just, there's a lot to do. You know, when guys get there, you know, the, the Seward trip is incredible fishing. They also have what they call fjord tour tours 
Pure Tours that uh, that's Azerbaijan, right? No, uh, they have Pure <laughs> Tours that you know you would think I would be tired of it after over twenty years there when family and friends come, but they're freaking awesome tours, you know. And so, even though I sold out a lot of it, I'm still running the boat that I sold a little bit, you know, for some clients that I've, I've had clients for over 20 years. And, um, you know, so if somebody's interested in the fishing package, you know, and wanted some information, I could obviously help them out, um, you know, still live right here in the heart of it all. So. To this day, with as long, you know, as many hunts and all those trips and stuff that you've been on, um, to this day, if you had to pick one of those animals that you hunt, which one of them is the one that just gets you going? Brown bears. And, and why? You know, multiple reasons, I guess. I mean, really, they're incredibly intelligent, for one. Um, you know, some of these bears we're killing are in excess of 20 years old. And, you know, this sounds horrible. Well, I don't know if it sounds horrible, but... They're more like people. They're they're moody. They change. You know, you think you got things figured out. Um, they're just a really, really neat animal to hunt. I mean, I just... And one of the biggest things about it is, you know, like this spring, we, did, we, you know, we had an incredible spring, is walking up to one of those bears when it's down and looking at that hunter. Because when you walk up and you see the sheer size, you know, they've got, they're picking up a paw... It's literally the size of their head. I mean, you just watch them. It's just, it's, it's, it's an awesome, awesome experience. It really is. And um, I've got the utmost, utmost respect for those big bears. I really do. I mean, everybody says, well, it's kind of an oxymoronic statement to say, you know, you got a lot of respect for them and let you, yet you kill them. You know, it just, but as hunters, we know, you know, we understand it. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I'd say that. How much will those big bears weigh? Those big, God, big you bears. Know, in the fall, they're in excess of a thousand pounds. It's um, wow. you know, I'm pretty, pretty good sized guy, and some of my guides are pretty good size. And you know, one of the toughest things is trying to position them. A lot of times for pitchers, you know, you try to move them around. You know, we get in the spring. A lot of them are more in the open. Um, matter of fact, this year we killed the biggest bear we've ever killed as far as lengthwise. It was a true ten five bear without stretching it. And it died in about a foot of water. And so the pitchers don't do it justice by any means. And then another one that was like 9-7, the same water, the same camp. Um, you know, two tremendous bears, and yet, you know, and, and you get the idea. You can look at them and see that they're giants. But um, you, you don't move them by any means. And that's in the spring. So that 10-foot-5 bear in the fall could be two to 300 pounds heavier. Um, Wow. Yeah, I don't know what it is about them, but they do. They they float my boat. Is that hunt a, a gl another type of a glassing hunt, yeah. or are you covering country on, on foot, or what? You know, what's a typical day? Brown typical bear day hunt? brown bear hunting is you are going to sit on your butt for a long time, and then you're going to sit on it for a little longer. Um, something I tell guys, you know, is. Bring a book, you know, be ready to sit. We're going to dress in layers. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a freak about equipment um, just because you're out there. But something a lot of guys can understand is they want to go up this valley or down that valley or across to that creek. A lot of people in the, in the world, obviously, you know, 80% of the population hunts white-tailed deer. And I'll tell them, those big brown bears are just like a 180-inch buck. If you bump them one time, you may see them again or you're going to turn totally nocturnal. You bump them twice, you're not going to see them again. And so most of my camps, we have spots that are typically relatively very close to camp where that's what we do. We glass, especially in the spring. Because in the spring, those bears are traveling a lot. You know, they're coming into estrus. Um, there's a lot of movement. And one question I get a lot, well, I get a ton, is should I come in the spring or should I come in the fall? And the difference is we typically see more bears in the spring and they're moving more. But and the, the one, one of the real, uh, the best things about spring is that a lot of times the alders aren't leaved up yet. You can see a lot. The difference being in the fall, when you see a bear do something, typically fish 
foraging or a food source, a lot of times you can pattern them. That's where in the spring, if you see a bear coming down the drainage, you don't get a crack at him. He might be there tomorrow, or he might be 10 miles away. But um, I'd say the biggest thing that makes up people's minds with stuff like that is a lot of guys like the spring because it doesn't interfere with their deer time, their elk time, their antelope time, whatever else they have going on. And then other guys are like, you know, this is such a big hunt. You know, I'll come whenever you tell me. So, uh, yeah. Let's talk about um, gear a little bit. Um, What do you recommend, uh, you know, and if you want to go through each hunt or if you just want to talk about gear in general, uh, I know you're kind of a gear junkie. What, give me the breakdown on what you tell people to bring uh, on most. You know, on everything we do in Alaska, um, you know, whether it's, you know, actually black bear, you know, brown bear, sheep, goat, everything we do, I tell people layers. Layering is, there's, there's no other way. If you're going to do it and you want to do it right, you wear layers, you get the best rain gear you can get. You know, people are under the assumption that it rains all the time. And after last fall, you know, I, I understand. About halfway through the guiding season, I started to grow mold. But, um, I mean, it, it, was, <laughs> it was ruthless. But, yeah, you know, depending on where we're at, it's absolutely layers. Um, back when I used to do more backpacking sheep stuff, Obviously, you do lighter, you know, same thing, layer up, you know, but you would, I mean, essentially take one set of clothes, and then I would bring changes of socks and changes of, you know, uh, uh, undergear. But other than that, you know, we pretty much wore the same pants every day. But, um, you know, I tell people there's a lot of things that we can't control in Alaska. One thing that we can control is our gear. And... um, so, you know, between the layering systems, um, the best boots, and, you know, people ask me, what are the best boots? I can answer what the best I've found are and what works for me, but everybody, you know, everybody varies. Um, I wear crispy boots, and I wear Canatrex. Those are what I've found, and they both... The full leather Full tennis leather tennis boots, boot. yep. So you wear crispy guide yep. boots and the Kenetrek uh, yep, mountain, mountain extreme, yeah, whatever there. Yeah, I wear those. And they're a real similar looking boot. Um, they are, for sure. and they fit my feet well. Um, now some of my guides have got Kenetreks and had a tough time with them. They just did not fit them well. It seems like it's either a love or hate, you know. And as as most people know, and if they don't, you know, don't ever buy a pair of boots then show up with them. You know, get out, wear those things, throw some weight on your back, make sure that they fit you well. Um, As far as from a perspective of being able to step into a boot and break it in pretty good, I think the Crispy is a better boot for that. If if your foot fits a Kenetrek, you know, so be it. Um, You know, but... But obviously, you know, Loa, Scarpa, there's there's a lot of good stuff out there. When people, like I said, I'll reiterate... They ask me, what is the best? I cannot answer what the best is. I can answer what the best I've found or I've used is. You know? Right. What's best they, for Exactly. For... And then, you know, as far as clothing gear, um, you know, I've worn Sitka. I've worn Cabela's gear. I've worn QU. Um, and I'm not jumping on anybody's bandwagon. I have all those clothes. But I'll tell you, I have not found clothes and especially rain gear that is better than QUs. Where? Yeah, um, the rain gear is incredible. Are you talking probably for your your bear hunts and stuff? You're probably talking either the Chugach or or the Yukon, the real the, thick the, Yukon. Which the you Yukon? Like and I'll tell you, even on my hunts where I'm backpacking, it's a little more weight. I have the Chugach and the Yukon. I've got a couple sets of them. Um, I stick with the Yukon just because I stay dry. And, you know, kind of like I said, oh, durable, and, and that's the, that is the biggest thing, you know, especially backpacking. And, you know, we get into a lot of alders, which for those that don't know, it's a lower brush. And, you know, it can be ruthless on gear. That that Yukon gear, you can't, it's, it's impervious. Having the side zips on it, yeah. being able to zip down, you know, having the, you know, the, yeah, it's absolutely, it, 
um, and the same with their yeah. pants. You know, I wear the the um, what they call a guide pant all the time, and uh, it just yeah. Being able to, like I said, the side zips. When we do get wet, I mean, it dries with next to no effort, and um, you know, I'm not jumping on a bandwagon. You know, I've worn it since they started, and uh, it is the best I've used. Again, not saying it's the best there is. I'm just saying it's the best I've ever freaking used. Yeah, I get it. Um, I want to end today on you telling the most hairy <laughs> bear, bear, bear story that you've got. Um, yeah, I was going to say, you know, I actually, we stalked in on a bear myself and a hunter and an incredibly good hunter. I don't, I don't know what happened. Um, this bear had a moose kill down, a, a, an adult bull. You know, people say, oh, they only get the weak and the, and the sick. But he had a full bull, a full-size bull moose dead. And um, where we saw him from, it was four, over 400 yards. And the problem was, once we lost that elevation, you could not see him again. And so I waited till the wind was good, and we stalked into about 20 yards. And my hunter is six, I think he's six eight, and um, I'm about six one. And I had marked it. I mean, we watched this this bear for hours and hours. And we got in there, and he wasn't at the carcass, so we were just standing still in the riverbed watching. Like I said, literally 20 yards away, and I see some some willows starting to move. And you can see they're coming towards the carcass. And I point at it. And um, so finally, we're probably two yards apart, six feet, looking. And I see Royce looks at me and he kind of gives me the he points. And, you know, and I can't see the bear. I mean, typically, most situations, I like to be able to see exactly what's going on. Um, you know, every hunter varies. Royce had hunted with me before. Um, like I said, completely competent. I think he killed the big five. A lot of hunting, and I whispered, "If you have a shot, take it." And uh, so he shot, and that bear spun and took off. And uh, you know, I said, "It was a good shot." You know, he says, "God, I don't think it was." And I, I, w- I was in shock. Well, he ran into a strip of of alders and brush, you know, willows that was probably 80 yards wide. And so we sat down for about an hour, and I said, "Let's go check where you shot." And I saw a little bit of blood, and I said, "Well." here's what I'm going to do. I said, I'm going to go up and make a loop around this. On the back side of this strip was the river, but between the river and the, and the brush is about 20 yards. And the, the rocks are very white and the sand is pristine. So if this bear made it out and crossed the river, I'm going to know. Bright, sunny day. I'm working my way down. I'm almost to the very end. I'm kind of past where he should have been. And I, I didn't have my sunglasses on. And I didn't see any tracks or blood coming out. I thought, okay, maybe he's dead in there. And I literally was about 12 yards from the end, I mean, from the brush line where it petered out to the end. And I caught, I thought something wasn't right. And I turned and looked. I thought, is that that? And in that instant, that bear had been looking towards where we were. He saw me and spun. And I'd already taken my scope off. I've got a detachable. I think it was seven yards where I shot him. He came out, he jumped. Most rivers, when you look at them, when they're at their high point, the banks will get deeper, then the middle of the river stays stays you know, shallower, but the edges wash out. What he did, he was laying on the edge of that, on the inside of the brush. When he jumped that, that deeper depression, and went to come up, I hit him. I literally split his chin and center-massed him. And um, the shot that he put on him was liver. You know, he'd, he'd got his liver and whatnot. You know, he, he, he would have died. But um, I'll tell you, when that freaking bear turned like that, I mean, I just reacted. It was more like pointing than it was, you know, aiming. <laughs> he was full-blown. He was coming. Oh, my goodness. He was coming. And, uh, what, what gun? That is an amazing story. What gun do you recommend for your brown bear hunts that guys use? You know, I don't so much recommend a caliber as I do something that you're comfortable with. You know, if a guy tells me that he's comfortable, you know, a lot of guys want an excuse to buy a 375 or a 416. And in all honesty, I carried a, a 300 Ultramag for years, and people said, oh, that's not enough gun. I said, well, 
I know some bears that might, you know, bear to differ, no pun intended. Um, <laughs> a good point in, in case was I had a guy come and hunt with me and it was a fall of 11. And when his hunt was finished, him and his brother-in-law each killed great bears. He said, I'd like to book a hunt next spring for my wife. You know, I said, great, you know, let's do it. Well, I stopped and saw them that February, and um, I met his wife. And so she said, well, you know, Bob's going to get a 375. And I, I backed him up a little bit. I said, didn't you say that Anita took the kids all deer hunting? I said, I saw the picture of all the bucks. Well, when he was a brown bear hunting with me, his wife took the three kids, and they shot four bucks. And she, sh- she said, yeah, I have a 30 out 6 She said, I absolutely love the gun. I shoot it incredibly well. I said, why would you ever change? I said, I want you to shoot either 180 grain or 200 grain you know, nozzle partition, you know, trophy bonded bear claw. You know, there's a, there's a list. There's too much good ammo out there for anybody to buy junk anymore. And so this long drawn out answer that I've given you is I like to stay with at least a 30 caliber. I have had guys shoot seven mags and they've killed them as dead as they get. Um, but typically at least a 30 caliber, but I care about accuracy and somebody being comfortable with a gun. That's, that is my biggest thing. It really is. You know, bullet, yeah. As long as bullet, yeah, I mean, people ask me all the yeah. time about, you know, like, what do we bring cooster hunting? And, you know, I tell them whatever gun you shoot yeah, the best. Exactly. Yep. Like those guys that shot seven mags, the two of them came together and they'd hunted all over the world and they carried those guns. And I think they went with 175 grain you know, trophy bonded bear claw or, or something of the, you know, a bonded bullet. And um, I said, you're not going to make them any deader than they need to be. You know, now if you're going in the brush and it's close encounters, you know, it may not be the best option. But here's the thing, you're not. You know, most of the time, you know, we're not going to have you shoot it in iffy time. You know, you're going to, it's going to be, you know, you're going to be in a situation 98 out of 100 times where you've got the time to make a good shot. And, uh, and I tell you, no matter how big they are, you know, you pop both their lungs or you shoot them through the chest, you know, that's it. It's all good stuff there. Um, well, it's been awesome talking to you. I want to give you a chance uh, to let people know how they can reach you. Um, why don't you do that for me, Frank? Well, our website's alaskatrophyoutfitters.com. Um, it is going through some updates now because, uh, as we talked about, the fishing stuff, um, you know, I'm not concentrating on it anymore. I'm doing some. But, yeah, alaskatrophyoutfitters.com. Our email is uh, info at alaskatrophyoutfitters. And... Um, they can call, also call my cell phone, which is 907-252-7413. And, um, and yeah, whether we can help you out with the hunt, you know, either book one for you, or if you're just looking for some advice, you know, I don't mean, I don't mind, you know, doing that one bit. Um, one thing I will say is email is a lot of times the best because with our scheduling, you know, we're in and out, you know, getting ready to head down your way to Arizona, run around. Um, so not always the most ultimate time to call but I can always respond to an email. Always. For sure. And um, are you planning on being at any of the shows coming up? Um, you know, I'll probably be at SCI again. I'm not going to have a booth. Typically I'm there. Um, what I do is I'll make a schedule and meet with people. You know, somebody wants to take a look at some pictures. Uh, I always have, you know, guys that have hunted with me around. You know, if I tell them, hey, you know, Scott wants to come by and he wants to hear about your experience, you've been there. Um, you know, I'll set up a meeting or something like that. Uh, if we get a few guys that are interested, you know, there's been times when I've had multiple people that I just book a suite for a couple nights, and then we'll have a cocktail hour or something like that. You know, guys can come by. I'll have a couple of photo albums there they can go through, you know. And a lot of guys, and I understand it, you know, we, we, we covered this earlier, you know, they've been taken or, or whatever. And I'm the same way. You know, when you look at a guy and you talk to him and you meet him face-to-face, you know, you can, you can get a read on him. And people are a lot more comfortable doing that. And I totally understand it. Yeah, yeah. for sure. But um, For sure. For sure. Um, did you draw any hunts uh, this, this fall or this winter? Do you have anything uh, that, you've, that you're hunting? Uh, no, no, I uh, got a bunch of points. You know, one of these, I think I got 19 elk points. So one of these years I'm going to come to Arizona and pasture you. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I go down to, I go down to hunt coos deer every year and I enjoy that. And um, went to Montana this year elk hunting. It was it was tough. We hunted the last week. It's usually you know a great hunt, but we lost most of it to weather. And you know hunting is what it is. I saw two of the biggest bulls I've ever seen though. So 
you know, when it's all, yeah, when it's all said and done, you know, but, um, didn't put an arrow in one. I know that. So, but, uh, Yeah. yeah. Well, um, it's been great having you on here. Thanks for sharing all your knowledge and, uh, look forward. I'll be at SCI, so I'll look you up and, um, yeah, uh, it's been great having you on and, uh, it's always great. Well, hey, I appreciate it. So, I appreciate the uh, chance to be on you. I really do. Sounds good, buddy. Well, um, God bless you and I'll catch you. All right. You later thank you. Take road, care. Okay.